Um, welcome everyone to the 12th installment of the Diatom Web Academy. I'm David Burge, I'm co-hosting today with Sylvia Lee and Mark Edlin. We're from the Society of Freshwater Science Diatom Taxonomic Certification Committee. And I wanted to quickly point out, in addition to today's talk, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers representing Macedonia, United Kingdom, and the United States coming up that'll be talking about species assemblage enumeration, classification of diatoms in relation to evolution, and diatom fish co-species invasion in rivers of the United States. I know some of you are going back to work now and figuring out how to work from home, and you may be unable to tune into the live stream anymore. And, and if you're unable to continue today, please go check out our YouTube channel, the Diatom TCC YouTube channel, where all the episodes are archived. Um, please leave questions or comments there. And especially, please uh, leave comments and questions today in the chat. Um, you know, the, the speakers don't always get to, to hear feedback from you guys or see your facial expression, so it's always, always nice to get a little uh, feedback for them. And also, I just wanted to throw out there, if you have any suggestions for the channel format, how we do the live stream, or any topics we should cover, or perhaps you would like to, uh, you know, host a, host a talk yourself, please uh, drop us a line at diatomtcc at gmail.com. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Mark so he can introduce today's speakers. Thank, thank you, David. Yeah, it's really a pleasure to introduce, introduce uh, today's speakers. I've, I've met both Shelly and Vicki at the at our annual ecology and systematics of diatoms class that we teach each year in, um, except this year, in, uh, in Iowa Lakeside Lab in Northwest Iowa. Um, we hope to be back next year teaching that class. Please, if, if you want, uh, reach out and we'll, we can uh, do what we can to help get you there. Um, Shelly and Vicki are Take, a, take a, a real different look at diatoms than a lot of us do. A lot of us are doing assessment and research, and they've taken it to a different level also where they're trying to understand ways that we can make the rest of the world appreciate diatoms as much as they should be appreciated by interjecting them into education and outreach programs. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Uh, Vicki is an assistant professor in biological scientist, uh, sciences at Tarleton State University, uh, and Shelley is a PhD candidate in, um, in science education at Texas Christian University. Um, I want to take, I want to welcome both of you and look forward to hearing what you're going to say. So thank you. Go ahead, you guys. Thanks, Mark, for the introduction. All right, Shelly. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. It's fun to have such an international audience at this. Uh, we hope you take away some ideas for things that you can incorporate into your own classrooms or your own outreach um, uh, libraries, if you will. So we, we called this golden brown op opportunities because, of course, diatoms are golden brown. Um, but there are lots of great opportunities for including diatoms in education. All right, so let us know in the chat, when did you first learn about diatoms and how did you first learn about diatoms? Excellent. Yeah, we have 1992 micropaleontology class class on algae as an undergraduate. I also learned um, about diatoms in college during my master's thesis, undergraduate class on demology, plant biology, 2013 start of my PhD. Lots of different answers here. Yeah, great. So the general trend is um, usually not until at least college, right, even later sometimes in your uh, higher education. Um, Shelly and I are kind of along the same way. Mine was probably when I was a senior in college, and it was sort of means to an end. I wanted a lab-based research internship just to see if I liked it, and I found a lab that taught diatoms, and I was like, yeah, that sounds fine. Um, and I 
surprised my advisors, I think, because I had been working on animal behavior. So it was quite the pivot, but obviously it's been great and I've never gone back. So yeah, and Michelle, my story, uh, it was my sophomore year in college. One night I was watching a forensic files episode and I felt like my TV screen just exploded with all these beautiful diatoms. I'm like, what the heck are those things? So I Googled diatom and I learned, oh, they're algae. So I looked at professors at my institution that studied algae and I came across James Wee. And so I was like, hey, can I come to your office and learn about diatoms? So we just chatted and that's when I learned his colleague Peter Cyber worked on that forensic diatom case and I got super excited. So uh, much like many of you, learning about diatoms through a course or a course in some way. Yeah. Great. So the flow of this presentation is that we're going to talk a little bit about scientific literacy as an introduction and incorporate how diatoms can be a part of that. And then I'm going to share some examples on how we can use diatoms in higher education, especially undergraduate education in lab and lecture. And then uh, since this is where most of us first met diatoms, Shelly's going to build that into how we can make it even earlier and start introducing uh, students to diatoms in high school. And then how can we can expand that to earlier education as well as lifelong learning and public outreach. And then we'll end with some recommendations and resources. All right, so you might be wondering why do we care about diatoms and diatom education? While diatoms are ecologically important for us, they produce at least half of the oxygen that we breathe and they are photosynthetic, so they're removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they are also the basis of aquatic food webs. Also, diatoms have a really nice relationship with society. We can use diatoms to uh, assess water quality, to reconstruct past environmental conditions, in nanotechnology, and in forensic science. So, we truly depend on diatoms at a societal level. And despite of their value and importance, they are often excluded from the science education curriculum. And there's not a whole lot of papers out there on diatom education, but if you take a look, some of the earlier papers between the 50s and 80s describe the biology of diatoms and saying how, oh, they're the neglected organisms or they're the ignored alga. Let's put the spotlight on diatoms. It's 2020 and the situation still does not look very different. In 2012, in the United States, the Next Generation Science Standards came out, and in the standards, there's no mention of the word diatom at all. So although curriculum writers have good intentions, uh, they are coming at this from a science education lens, but not necessarily um, what scientists know about diatoms. So there's a major disconnection between what the curriculum writers know and what the diatomists and the diatom community know. So we need a way to bridge the gap to promote di diatom education. And just a little fun, fun memes here for you enjoy, because uh, the trees get all the darn credit, but uh, the diatoms and the algae, they, they do so much for us. All right, so one major goal of science education is to promote scientific literacy. And so we can define literacy as using the scientific knowledge to make informed decisions um, personally and thinking about for societal environmental um, aspects. And for scientific literacy, we want learners to engage in problem solving and understanding how science works. Literacy is very important, particularly during this time of this pandemic in which there's so much misinformation being spread. We want our learners to be engaged in literacy. And so we can look at scientific literacy through the lens of something called the nature of science. So the nature of science is a framework here in three parts, looking at basically what are the characteristics of science? How does science work? What separates science from other forms of knowledge? And so to promote literacy, we can use diatom education. First, one element we can look at are the tools and products of science. So we know that science is based upon empirical evidence. So how do we help students understand that and use the tools and learn the norms of how scientists operate in the world? So let's say, for example, we're taking students out in the field to collect diatoms. They come back in the lab and they learn how diatomists operate. They learn how to identify diatoms. They learn how to count diatoms under the microscope. 
and then they learn how to use the evidence that they've gathered to construct an argument and present their findings. So it helps them understand how science works. Another element of literacy is knowing that science has human elements. So scientists have curiosity and that curiosity drives the direction of research. Also, science has an element of human creativity. So as students are designing investigations, they can have creativity in how they're gonna carry out their investigation, such as like how are they gonna collect samples with spoons and turkey basters or other fun ways, or how they're gonna go investigate their samples in the lab. So instead of these contrived, boring cookbook labs, we want students to understand that scientists use creativity to do science. And the last element we wanna think about is that science is tentative but durable, and is also subject to change in light of new evidence. And a great example is diatom taxonomy. So as our technology has improved over time, so is our understanding of diatoms, and we've had to make some revisions over the years. And so collectively though, these three elements can help promote literacy through the lens of diatom education. So Vicki's now gonna tell you more about how we can engage learners. Yeah, so one way we can engage learners is by moving away from these cookbook labs that are very formulaic and have a, a correct answer where there's only one answer at the end, and instead move towards what's known as scaffolded inquiry-based learning. So inquiry-based means that rather than these cookbooks, students are encouraged to do experiments where they have more control over what they're actually doing and they can ask questions and pursue things that interest them. And then scaffolded is very similar to how scaffolding is put around a building that's being constructed to help support it. So we as instructors provide the basic knowledge and techniques to train students how to start to think this way. So really we're uh, creating scientists. We're teaching them how to use these methods to answer questions, how to pose those questions in ways that can be tested and then how to use the scientific method to work towards an answer. And then just like scaffolding, you slowly take that away over time and then you leave the building standing by itself. So in the end, you have a student who's ready to move forward using the scientific method in their career. So in order to do this, we can use something known as levels of inquiry. So usually where a lot of labs end up is down here in this bottom tier in limited inquiry, which are more of the traditional labs, these cookbook labs. Those aren't bad because it is necessary to learn these basic methods, especially in intro classes, that as students, especially undergraduates, get into upper level classes, we should start encouraging them to branch out a little bit and to get more involved in the actual process of the scientific method. So the next step up is structured inquiry, where you, there's no longer a right answer. And so you, you give them the question, you give them directions on how to use the methods, but the conclusions they draw are based on their own investigation. Take that up one more step into guided inquiry. And so you give them the question, but you take away the methods. And so now they have to decide the best way to address the question or the objective that they've been given. And then the final and fourth tier is open inquiry where there's no predetermined question, it's totally open. They can propose any hypothesis they want, pursue it, build their own uh, methods and collect their own data. And that is a more complete picture of the scientific method and more realistic to what scientists are. So it's to encourage them and give them the background to be good scientists when they get into their professional fields. To give you an example of how this can work in an undergraduate course, um, in my limnology course, we don't necessarily focus solely on diatoms, but diatoms certainly play a large role in it. But we'll start with some introductory labs where we go and take samples and look at them in the labs and they learn how to use things like dichotomous keys and some of the books and of course the diatoms of North America website um, because it's very user friendly to get a sense of what they're looking at and why and how they get to a, the, the answer of a certain species. Then we'll build on that with a more structured inquiry type of activity where they choose a species that they found in the field, try to identify it themselves and then post it to iNaturalist so that other naturalists can weigh in and uh, say whether they were um, correct or not and help them uh, network with this larger natural community. So there's no predetermined answer there because it, they chose the organism, it's whatever they think it is. 
but um, it also starts to tie them into more research-based objectives because on iNaturalist, if it reaches a research grade identification, that organism then enters a larger data set that can be used for actual research. Then we'll take that one more step later on in the semester with some guided inquiry, so, uh, which is where we, we've taught them the methods and how to go about it, but now they have to decide exactly what to do. So in this case, the students do a service learning project where they go to a local pond or a stock tank uh, and talk to the landowner about any water quality issues the pond may have, any challenges it's facing, and also the goals the landowner has for the pond. Do they want it to continue being a stock tank for cattle? Would they rather turn it into a fishing pond? What are they looking for? And then based on that, the students will have to um, formulate some of their own methods about what they should look at in the field and in the lab to assess the water quality of that pond and then give the landowner some um, suggestions about how to manage it into the future to get them really thinking about the connection between ecology and natural resource management. And then finally, we end with open inquiry where the students are given a set of um, mesocosm streams that they can manipulate in any way they want over the course of four to five weeks. And so they can ask their own question, what do they want to do to manipulate either the habitat or the water chemistry of these streams, figure out how they're going to do that, what data they need to collect, and then how they're gonna analyze that data. So they end with an open inquiry thing. So that goes over the course of the semester. The other nice thing about diatoms is that they're really adaptable in terms of what they can focus on. So they were involved as part of a larger picture in what I was just talking about. So more of this uh, uh, or, uh, community ecology aspect or ecosystem ecology aspects, but we can also use them in terms of their taxonomy and their odd ecology. So these examples are from my phycology class, which I teach in the spring. And uh, we're um, spoiled down here in Texas because this is what February looks like. And so we're able to go out relatively early in the year to collect samples. And we already have a lovely, healthy uh, diatom population to pull from. So we start with diatoms because they're what, they're, are, they're, what, they're what are prevalent at the time, but they also have uh, a pretty clear set of taxonomic rules to figure out what they are. Um, so they're a good place to start. So uh, we used iNaturalist again, and this helps um, the project that this is built around is to build an understanding of different types of diatoms live in different habitats. So if you take diatoms from a stream in central Texas, you're going to get a different assemblage than what you get from a wetland on the coast of Texas. Then they'll choose a diatom that they are particularly fond of, and they'll get to know it really, really well. So they'll identify it, um, and they will construct a page that's very similar to what's on diatoms of North America. And we call it range extensions because a lot of times they're working with species that are already listed there, but they have to prove that it's the same species. And then we use those to build a local flora. And then as part of that, they have to consider several aspects of their taxonomy. Um, this is a project they did in one lab where they used modding, modeling clay to build a 3D model, just looking at light micrographs and SEM images to help them think through the details of the of the structure, the ultrastructure of the frustral uh, that leads to that um, identification. And then um, at the end, they have something along the lines of what we see published. Diatoms can also be involved in undergraduate research. Shelley uh, had an example of doing undergraduate research with diatoms. Um, they're great for field-based research that you can also do things in the lab. Again, my budget-friendly mesocosms where they can run um, samples for, uh, usually we go about 10 weeks, so a semester, and they can collect data and then look at that. So um, the one we're about to start this semester is on pharmaceuticals. And then, of course, diatoms can be put everywhere. They don't just belong in the lab or in the field. And so I like to try to fit diatoms wherever I can in my lectures, in any course I can get them into. So. Uh, a lot of these are adapted from activities meant for younger students that are longer. And what I've done is I've shortened them and made them a little bit more to the point so that they can be done relatively quickly in class with an older group of students. 
So for example, this is an adaptation of a, an activity from a book called The Virus and the Whale on the evolution of Stephanodiscus yellowstonensis in Lake Yellowstone. So this is a dollar store pill organizer that I am treating like a biostratigraphy. So each level has a different assemblage of diatoms and pollen. So they'll take that out, analyze it, and then we'll discuss how Stephanodiscus yellowstonensis evolved over time in relation to climate and landscape uh, changes as inferred by the pollen proxies. This core down here is another example with a slightly different focus. So this is a lake sediment core that focuses on uh, about a century's worth of changes in a lake in Minnesota. Um, that's a, that was a younger um, audience that we developed that activity for when I was in Duluth with the Great Lakes Aquarium. Uh, and I've just adapted it to be a little bit shorter and to the point for undergraduates, but that's also available for younger learners. And then this down here is a sorting activity that's really easy to hand out in the middle of lecture, give them a few minutes and just tell them to sort these into four groups based on uh, their aspects of their morphology. And so this is a uh, fresh water version and then there's also a marine version. So I use these in a couple of different classes. But the nice thing about diatoms is because of their shapes and their patterns, people catch on to certain trends that we use in their taxonomy relatively quickly, even without any real prior explanation. So they can inherently work on that and then you can uh, discuss it with them and double check how they did and then talk about, um, use that as a basis to talk about things like morphology and taxonomy and also how their morphology relates to their autocology and their habitat use. So those were undergraduate um, experiences and those are great and that's a, a good place to start, but we'd like to take it even younger and get students interested younger because a lot of research finds that by the time students reach college, they already sort of know what they're interested in or not interested in uh, and where they want to head. So really the trick is to get even younger to high school or even middle school um, to get them interested in these types of science. So college prep diatoms is a course at Iowa Lakeside Lab that was I think first launched in 2012. It's opened to high school students and it's a great intensive training in diatoms. So it's a small group of students that get to spend time in the field with early career researchers. So uh, like here's Shelly, here's Sylvia. Um, and they get training in field collection and lab preparation and observation and an introduction to diatoms. And the main purpose of it is to make them enthusiastic about this type of research. And then nowadays they have an optional one week, uh, a second week where they can actually focus on research and do some research. Of course, we do other fun things too, like make shirts or one year they need stuffed uh, like diatom plushies. Um, and it's, oh yeah, <laughs> like Shelly's holding up. So, and it's a great opportunity for them um, because they get all sorts of experience from it. So they get a uh, kind of formal, somewhat formal research experience, they get to use real research equipment, they get to go to research um, locations and meet professionals. So this is a trip to LACOR in Minnesota, and then they can build on this. So this is Kevin, and he uh, was a member of CPD for two years in a row with Shelly and Sylvia, and then he applied for an REU uh, to come down to Texas and work with me for a summer. I'm surprised he agreed to do that on <laughs> Texas in the summers. An interesting place to be, um, but he worked on building a diatom floor for our biological field station down here in central Texas, and he found about 100 species and over 40 genera, so which shocked uh, everyone who came to the, the poster session that it was so diverse. And then this is um, him at the, uh, the National RU Research Symposium in Alexandria, Virginia. And then up here is a pre and post survey answer to the question, what are diatoms and why are they important? They're from this, um, these answers are from the same student. And you can just see what an impact it makes, not only the fact that they're able to identify why diatoms are and recognize why they're important, but I also just love the fact that in the post survey it says, this is a goofy question. Like, of course diatoms are this, and of course they're important, where just a week earlier they had, you know, they actually had a pretty good idea of what they were, but it wasn't 
great. So how, um, but if you can get that enthusiasm, right, they're going to remember what it is and then spread that information and tell other people as well. So All now right. Shelly's gonna take it into high school. And we wanna continue expanding diatom education for high school students, for those who may not be able to attend a class such as such and find other ways to learn. So I wanna give you some context for how I got into this work. For my master's thesis, I studied diatoms and turtles. And at the time I was working with a student on a separate project. And in the back of my mind, I always thought it would be fun to uh, continue like mentoring students in some way on research. So the opportunity came about three years ago when my colleague, Mr. Andrew Brinker here on the upper, uh, yeah, right there. Uh, he is a local high school teacher who also happens to be a herpetologist. So he was like starting this turtle survey and I heard that he was getting his high school students out there. And so I asked him, can we collaborate and can we get students working on projects? So we started in October of 2017 and we would go out to the river once a month for about four hours. So during this time, this is when students are helping collect uh, turtles out of the uh, hoop net, as you can see there on the left. And then when students take the turtles out of the trap, they're measuring the turtles, such as carapace length, width, uh, measuring their mass and etc. And they learn how to identify the turtles and they begin thinking about what do they want to ask as research questions. So we see the common snapping turtle, uh, the musk turtles, red-eared slider, and the river cooter on the bottom uh, right. So given the different turtle species, students can begin to ask questions like, how did the diatoms compare on these different turtle species? Or if they're more interested in the turtle aspects, they can use whatever data they want to collect. So for an example, one student did a project looking at the mercury concentration in turtle uh, fingernail clippings. Or for the students more interested in the diatom aspects, they'll work with me. So on this picture on the bottom right, here's a student sampling diatoms from this turtle. And to standardize the areas sampled on the turtle, the student is using this diagram here. So the green shaded areas represent the areas sampled. So the student will place a tube on top of the shell and use a brush to scrub in it and collect the sample. And so this is just a really fun time for students to get hands on with the turtles and collecting diatoms. And then most of our work will now happen in the classroom. So in the classroom, this is where they spend most of their time. Uh, so as they are developing research questions in the back of their minds, this is when they're learning about diatoms. So this time after school usually meet anywhere from one to three times a week, depending on their schedule. And our work can last anywhere from one semester to one year and a half, depending on their level of interest. So in the very beginning, students are learning some diatom basics. So in the upper left, students are learning how to process diatoms to remove the organic material. And on the bottom uh, left here, they are learning identifications at the genus level. So we use diatoms of North America, a wonderful website. We also use uh, diatom books. And then during this time, students get comfortable using the microscope and identifying what they have. And once they're able to be scaffolded, thinking about um, what Vicky talked about earlier with the levels of inquiry, once they're more independent, then they can truly work on their research projects with the end goal of presenting. So we encourage our students to present in local opportunities, such as the local nature club. One student gave a talk on a Wednesday night to an audience of non-scientists, um, or we also encourage them to go to a science conference. So they've been to the turtle conference or the informal science education conference in Texas. So if you have opportunities to work with students, I would strongly encourage you to uh, mentor students. It's really fun. All right, so in moving forward, we want to continue advocating for um, promoting diatom education. And historically, science has excluded uh, students of color. So we would just want to continue thinking, how can we expand diatom education and literacy as a whole with um, just more different populations of students? And so I just want to give you an example of how I did diatoms with another collaborator and working with English language learners. Uh, this is a uh, increasing uh, population with 
in the United States, particularly here in Texas. And so a challenge for all educators is thinking, how do we accommodate culturally and linguistically diverse learners? And so with this ELL population we worked with, these children came from a middle school where the children represent 47 different languages. So it's definitely a challenge, but we wanted to ensure that in this summer program called the Math, Science and Language Enrichment Program, we wanted to help improve their science knowledge, but also have fun while they're learning. And so we don't wanna to focus too much on natural language, but more on um, really emphasizing hands-on learning and visual representations. So in the program, uh, students are in science class for part of the day, and they're also in math class for the other part of the day, and then they switch. So for a particular lesson, I taught the science class on food webs. So in the beginning of the session, students were observing diatoms under the microscope, making some observations. And then we talked about some concepts like producers, consumers, et cetera. And then students began their investigation looking at macroinvertebrates from a local river. So they used an identification sheet to identify what was there and then classify them based on the pollution tolerance index. And then in math class, students learned about geometry with diatoms. So for the first portion, they looked at symmetry of a pen pennate diatom and a centric diatom. And so they had these cutouts as shown here. And this red tool here is called Mira. And it's a reflective tool that helps students find the line of symmetry. So in this example, they could see, oh, with the pennate diatom, the line of symmetry is along its length and also across its width. And then they did the same thing with the centric diatom. And then when students were asked to fold the centric diatom, they noticed that there were an infinite number of lines of symmetry. And so they can see how the symmetry differed just on, based on morphology. And then for the second portion, students looked at different pictures of diatoms. And so they would make observations of their shape and the number of edges that these diatoms had and would communicate it in their own language. And then at the end, we came together for diatom art. So there's a really great YouTube video um, with Klaus Kemp arranging diatoms on a slide. And then after we watched that fun video, students had to think about what they learned in math class as they were making their diatom models with model magic. And they got to color it and share their models with their classmates. So the diatoms were just a great model with the ELLs. All right, so to expand other um, ideas, we can always connect diatoms to big conceptual ideas as outlined in the science education standards. So for example, if you wanna teach biodiversity, bring diatoms in the picture. So I did an activity in which students compared the biodiversity of two lakes. So we had one envelope represent one, representing one lake and another envelope representing another lake. So as they take these, um, open the envelopes and take the pictures out, they can see that there's different diatom species. And so what they're gonna do first is uh, figure out what species are there. So they create a list and then they look at the species richness and the relative abundance. And then they compare the two communities in our two simulated lakes. And then they begin to form some ideas of why might these diatom communities differ between these lakes. In another example, we have used food chain Jenga. So this is a really fun game. You can see at the bottom of our food web, we have our phytoplankton with a uh, ketosteros on there. And the food chain Jenga is on a placemat and you can kind of see the sun to indicate, you know, uh, the energy comes from the sun. And students will sit across from each other. So one student sitting on one side of the placemat, student sitting on the other side, and they have event cards associated with this game. So they read the event, they predict what will happen, they talk it out with each other, and then they remove certain blocks within the Jenga. So as an example here, one event card notes, agricultural runoff often contains pesticides that are toxic to specific species. Predict what would happen if the runoff uh, contained pesticides that were toxic for plankton. So as students engage in argumentation, then they figure out, okay, what's gonna happen? And then within this little um, card slot, they pull out what they need to do. So then next it tells them to subtract one phytoplankton, for example. So then they remove the blocks and then over time, they can see how these events um, impact the food web structure. And then over time, it'll collapse. 
And just to give you another activity, let's say you're teaching about adaptations. And so you can look at diatomorphology through 3D printing. And so I know that 3D printing seems expensive and it is, but I would encourage you though to see what um, ways you might be able to do it through a public library as public libraries now have more 3D printers or even your institution might have a 3D print, printer. So look for those opportunities. And so I'll give an example of how I used it for a STEM program. Uh, for the first part of the day, we had students go out to the river, collect diatom samples and observe the diatoms. And then the second half of the day, we wanted them to take a deeper dive in morphology. And so they designed their diatom in Tinkercad and then they printed their diatom and we asked them to observe, okay, like what features do you see and how might these uh, features relate to the lifestyle or odd ecology of this diatom? And so just another way to think about diatom adaptation. And then lastly, we can think about um, teaching about human impacts. So there's a great online simulation called Sim River. And so along this river, students can manipulate certain conditions such as the land use or the population level. And so as they manipulate the conditions along the river, they can see how the diatom communities are impacted by these activities. And so then they can think about the application of diatoms and uh, inferring water quality. All right, so to expand diatoms outside of the classroom, right, if we want to improve science literacy, it's important for us to reach out to the public and teach them about diatoms. And so this can vary depending on uh, the type of outreach. So I just want to give you a few examples of things I've done. Uh, I've done BioBlitz. And in case you are not familiar, BioBlitz is an event where scientists and citizen scientists come together to inventory all the diversity in a given area in 24 hours. And so another example is maybe going to your local school district and presenting at um, STEM Expo, for example, or a community after school program on the bottom right working with children. So there's different ways you can look for outreach opportunities. Whenever you're doing outreach, you wanna first always think about your end goal. What do you want your audience to walk away with? I've learned over the years that spewing a bunch of diatom facts might lose people very easily. So I try to just share maybe like one or two key things and then let them explore. And so the first thing is that you want to think about your audience. Do you just have children? Do you just have adults? Or do you have everyone across the board? And that's very important because that will impact the second part of this, the degree of structure that you provide. I learned over the years the hard way, so learn from my mistakes. Sometimes little children get bored very easily and they have a short attention span. So you wanna have multiple activities that they can explore so that they have more free choice. So let's say at station number one, they can decorate diatom jewelry boxes. Station number two, they can observe aquatic samples. You wanna have multiple activities for a younger audience. And if you have an older audience, that's when you can have more structure such as um, presenting something or um, structuring the time. So for instance, with a bio blitz, um, let's say if I had a two hour time slot, for example, you know, people can go out and collect samples and then maybe in the second half they can make diatom plushies. So you just wanna think about how you're going to um, fill in the time with your audience. Lastly, you wanna think about resource availability. And so I know that seems pretty obvious, but sometimes there's challenges depending on where you're located. Located. So particularly for a bio blitz, um, if you're trying to inventory all the diversity in 24 hours, um, processing diatom samples can take a while. So there's been times in the past where we brought a muffle furnace and we're able to cook the diatoms really fast. And so uh, Josh Cooper has been wonderful in inventorying the diatoms over the last several years of bio blitz. Another consideration is that if you have um, microscopes, you want to bring extension cords, right? So just thinking about those simple things. All right, so and why you should care about um, the informal learning environments. Uh, research shows that 95% of our learning actually takes place outside of the formal classroom and in the informal environments, such as museums, zoos, botanical gardens, thinking about also where you learn about information through magazines. So now Vicki's gonna tell you about the importance of our informal environments. Thanks, Shelley. So yeah, lifelong learning is a 
great um, way to share the joy of diatoms as well because it reaches more people at all stages of life. So this is a somewhat more formal setting than some of the outreach activities that Shelley just described. But museums, uh, zoos, aquariums, uh, institutions like that are great resources. A lot of times they are research partners and so they're inherently interested in sharing information about the research going on. So for example, this is Shelley's master work um, at Sam Noble Museum, Museum of Natural History, among others. Um, and then actually this is my master's work that's now on display at the Great Lakes Aquarium in Duluth. So uh, local museums are really great as well um, because they're interested in these, these local points of interest. These are um, a couple of diatom specific exhibits. Uh, so this one is uh, the exhibit on, on Stephanodiscus yellowstonensis that's at the Nebraska State Museum. So this is on the work of uh, Sherry Fritz and Ed Terrio in Yellowstone. It's also the basis of the diatom evolution activity from the virus and the whale that I mentioned before. So it's part of a larger exhibit on evolution. And that's usually where we see diatoms show up in museum exhibits is it's not necessarily an exhibit just on diatoms. A lot of times it's part of the larger picture, but that's also good because it enforces the importance of diatoms in the larger community and the larger ecosystem. For example, this is a really beautiful uh, exhibit in the National Museum of Iceland on freshwater environments and diatoms show up several places, but usually in the context of trophic interactions. Now these are all for older uh, consumers. And so there's also a lot of potential for engaging children in some of those more interactive corners of museums. So this up here is at the Nebraska State Museum. It's a beautiful 3D wooden puzzle that was painted by Mike Harrison. And so it's um, for small children to use, uh, they're attached with Velcro, but they can put diatoms in their um, locations and it's the basic concept that different types of diatoms live in different types of habitats. And this one is centered around Antarctica. And then uh, to go back to 3D printing again, um, maybe not Catoceros, but other <laughs> species of diatoms that are a little bit more sturdy might be good for an area where um, kids can actually pick them up and play with them and kind of uh, turn them around and <laughs> bang on them a little bit to learn uh, these basic shapes because there's just so much diversity in the shapes and diatoms are just really, really pretty. There's also ways to um, get diatoms out there in the public in other uh, ways. The, uh, the fact that they're so beautiful really works to their advantage. <laughs> they're easy to fall in love with because of that. So they can be part of public art installations. Um, this is a really uh, famous one that's in Oregon. There's, this is, these are just a few examples of these huge concrete sculptures of diatoms that are around the campus there. And then this is a recent art installation at Indiana State University where the sculpture worked in collaboration with Jeffrey Stone uh, to look at diatoms and interpret them in a more artistic uh, sense in terms of their patterns. And then also in terms of lifelong learning, a lot of outreach and uh, education focus can be put on the young, the young kids, which is certainly important because we want to get them interested in these types of um, scientific questions and areas, but we can also interact a lot with adults because it is lifelong learning and adults can become very interested in things they've never heard about before. And so they're another great group to work with. So going back to iNaturalist, it's possible to create iNaturalist groups or clubs based on an organism or based on a region. So you can network that way with people in your area who are interested in the same things you're in. You could also create projects on iNaturalist. So if someone happens to be in, say, a park uh, that you create a project for, they can submit pictures to you to um, help them ID. So that's another way to get them more involved in the process. A uh, master naturalist, there are several chapters around the nation. They're usually looking for guest speakers. I give a guest, um, I do a guest speaker event at a couple of different chapters every year down here, um, but they're also really interested in uh, these types of organisms, and I've gotten a lot of feedback before, like, I've never even heard of diatoms, and I'm 60 years old, so um, they're usually really an engaged community to work with, 
And then um, things like Osher Lifelong Learning Institute or other lifelong learning programs are usually targeted towards the 55 plus demographic. And these tend to be short courses that can be six or so lectures that you can volunteer to do and uh, folks take them just because they're interested in the topic. And so that's another way to get more in depth on certain topics with adult learners. And then Skype a Scientist is at least currently focused on younger audiences. Who knows, they might expand or things like Skype a Scientist might come up that expand. But I included this as an example of the fact that, especially nowadays, there's going to be the advancement of connecting with these broad public audiences to do outreach over the internet. And so there's already something of a platform to do that. So you can still outreach. And they're great because they're short, you know, 20, 30 minutes long, interactive. You can stay in your lab and just give them a quick experience about what it's like uh, to be a scientist. And that's a really good way to engage with the public. All right, so we have several recommendations for how to uh, promote science literacy through diatom education. One way is to share funds of knowledge. So again, the formal classroom is one way to learn about diatoms, but we want to capitalize on other ways that uh, students can learn about diatoms, such as this wonderful children's book, The Hidden World of Diatoms, I recommend this book, or maybe watching fun shows like One Strange Rock. Another way is to communicate to the public. So Vicki had mentioned there's ways that people may not know about diatoms, so get the word out. Your local school district is often looking for ways to bring science and make it more authentic. So it's a great way to share what you do as a scientist and collaborate with teachers. And so thinking about this third point, um, it's really important that we get diatom education out there because again, there's not a whole lot in the education literature. So if you're a university professor or uh, consider reaching out to local teachers in your, in your area or vice versa, if you're a teacher thinking about reaching out to professors in your local area. And so, for example, uh, some of you may know Rebecca Bixby. She's a diatomist and she worked with a high school teacher and they presented a diatom uh, lesson on um, le students learning about water quality. So they published it in a National Science Ed journal. And so just a lot of great opportunities there to publish as well. You can also consider working with high school students on research. And again, that can also tie into publishing work with students. And then lastly, you also want to think about how you can volunteer for outreach. So thinking about formally in the classroom or informally through like after school programs, um, or maybe even thinking how to set up things like Skype with scientists so you can just get the word out about diatom. So hopefully with all of these things in mind, we can change the narrative of shifting diatoms from the, uh, as diatoms from stop being the neglected organism to being the cherished organism. So hopefully we can get the public excited about diatoms. And then one last recommendation is that the PSA recently crowdsourced a spreadsheet of activities and syllabi from a, um, psychology in general to teach on all topics of algae. And it's curated at this Google Doc. And it's great. There's, I think, um, over 100 entries on it. But it's heavily dominated by mac macro algae right now, like the kelp. So we need more diatoms. And this is also potentially a great resource for us because a lot of us have developed diatom activities, but we might not have them published in any formal way. So this is a good way to get uh, the message out because we can just add a link to our own Google Doc or something so people can find it. Um, and that is it. So um, <laughs> thanks for tuning in and listening and hopefully you got some inspiration about some things you can do in your own classroom or your own outreach. And um, yeah, so we'll take questions. Yeah, we appreciate you all being here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelly and, and Vicki. That was a wonderful talk and so many resources that you showed. Um, there is a question here already. Um, great talk. Um, this is Lawrence. I'm an assistant professor lecturer from the Philippines. He's handling the psychology class and with the current situation using an online platform for teaching and learning. Um, how would you link or integrate lab activities that deal with diatoms or phytoplankton um, since there is difficulty accessing lab and materials? Yeah, absolutely. I am um, somewhat in the same boat, so <laughs> I, I feel this. Uh, so um, a, cu a couple 
suggestions for what you could do. So since there aren't necessarily the ability to use microscopes or really go out in the field and collect your own samples, your students could become something of a resource for a platform like iNaturalist. So maybe they're not posting their own photos, but they could be tasked with finding photos of algae posted by other people who haven't really been uh, verified yet and then work on using the um, the taxonomic keys and things like that to give those uh, a better um, identification, right? So kind of act as the experts in that way. Uh, something else uh, you could do, so I teach phycology in the spring, so we had a shift online um, this spring, so we lost half our lab season. And so what I did instead was we did readings. We read scientific papers and then we had Zoom calls and I basically just got on Twitter and asked if anyone would be willing to talk to my students about their field of expertise and got a really great, wonderful, surprising response. And so at every call we had um, two or three experts in that group of algae to tune in to just talk about what they love the most. And so I think the nice thing about phycologists is we're, we tend to be kind of a small close knit community anyway, but we're usually willing to give some time to, to help um, encourage the next generation. So that's another way you could reach out and network a little bit too. Great. Uh, another question we have is from Mark. Uh, Vicki, do you use a specific iNaturalist project format for your students' diatom IDs or just the standard format? Um, I have a kind of a worksheet thing that they fill out just to make sure that they fill in all the information that I would like them to. So uh, on iNaturalist, you can basically just post a photo and say like, I think it's this and leave it at that. It's, <laughs> it can be very minimalist. So I have them do more work uh, in that they have to provide more detail about the description and the size range and things like that in the, um, the text box that goes underneath the box. Um, the picture and then also uh, provide some odd ecological information and so they'll fill out a worksheet first that they turn into me um, that I grade and then they also post that on iNaturalist. So it's a little more structured that way, yeah. Okay, also in the chat um, we have a plug for microscopy clubs, uh, one oh, yeah. is called the Quaquette Microscopical Club, not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Uh, but they also do bio blitzes in the UK. That's very neat. Um, and then there is another uh, comment here that uh, kind of like a WhatsApp group for diatom information could be cool. Um, but what do you think um, folks should do if they um, want to get information about um, taxonomy and you know trying to identify species that they encounter? Um, oh. Yeah, Shelly, you want to start? I mean, I just naturally just think diatoms of North America is a great start. Right? Yeah, yeah, I don't think we've plugged that enough. Get on the website. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for real, though, it is, um, if you've never been on it, it's very user friendly. And so you can just kind of click through uh, certain steps. And also, there are a few previous diatom web academies that focus on uh, taxonomy. So those might be good resources too, even if you just kind of take out small sections of them to help teach your class in a more um, like focused, focused fashion. Thanks for mentioning those. Um, there's also a Diatom L email listserv. You can send mm -hmm. pictures um, of your specimens to get um, identification help from experts. And um, you can also feel free to send an email to a person you think might have expertise in that diatom group or diatom genus and get their opinion about it. Yeah. Another question here is from Anna. Um, I know where and how I can reach out and talk about my science, but I have no idea how to reach scientists if I want someone to talk with my own child, given that the school is doing it online and is not doing much? Are there opportunities for individual kids and not just groups? Yeah. Hi, Anna. Um, yeah, so Skype a Scientist, this spring at least, opened up 
um, the platform for individual families to sign up for scientists to Skype with them instead of having to be a, a whole class. Uh, so I did a I did a couple of those with um, students. And when scientists sign up, they basically tick some boxes saying what they're interested in. So you can get either very specific or very general, uh, just kind of see who's available to talk. I don't know if they'll do that this fall, but it seems like a lot of kids, a lot of families will still be homeschooling. So that might be a possibility, at least one. There was an earlier comment here about um, how someone got interested in diatoms through forensic files. Um, I think that would be a really um, cool um, tidbit to share if you could, Shelly, um, you know, like an activity or something you did involving uh, diatoms and forensics. Yeah, so uh, for my undergrad research, um, we just, I just threw some hair in water and was like, all right, let's just look at the algae growing on hair over time. So even if it's not like a formal research project that students will end up presenting later, I just think that the, the hands-on activities of like students just investigating is really fun. So if you can provide uh, opportunities for inquiry, I know it's a little bit hard right now with COVID, but um, in the future, maybe once we meet in person, thinking about how to engage those learners through just ex doing experiments. And in the meantime, though, like I would encourage you to look at SimRiver as an online activity, see what's out there. Uh, in addition to the lesson plans, maybe see what the K through 12 lesson plans are and how you might modify those for this online environment. Great, um, here's a question from Kelsey. Great presentation. Why do you think diatoms have been neglected from K-12 curricula? And how would you argue to a K-12 curricula writers that diatoms should be included, uh, maybe at the sake of excluding other topics? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I think that, uh, why have they been neglected? Uh, I think because curriculum writers don't know about diatoms. And I'll just give examples of how we can maybe get them included in the curriculum. Uh, so for instance, in, here in Texas, we have the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, and they actually invite people to come contribute to the standards. So some of my science friends sign up and they actually go to um, Austin, Texas, and they argue with other people about what should be included in the curriculum. So uh, maybe be on the lookout for opportunities where you can maybe attend uh, those kinds of things at your locally to contribute to the curriculum. So if you can be there at the table and have a voice, maybe you can help as a scientist and a diatomist, right? You can help have a say in how the curriculum is written. I don't know if I answered that. Let's see. Yep, she says that was great. <laughs> okay. If there's any last questions, um, just want to thank you both for um, the presentation and for everyone participating today. Um, this webinar will be recorded and available at a later time and we'll keep you updated by email, social media, media on the um, lineup of speakers that are coming up. So I think we will end it there. Thanks everybody. Have a good day. Thank you very much for coming. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.